Hi, I'm Todd Harrison, and I'm here today to talk to you about social mood as a leading indicator of the stock markets, bucking conventional wisdom. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? As it pertains to social mood, I can look back at probably one of the most misunderstood dynamics in the financial history is the stock market crash of 1929. Conventional wisdom holds true that the crash of 1929 caused the Great Depression. I would offer, humbly offer, that is, uh, that the Great Depression caused the stock market to crash. In other words, social mood and risk appetites shaped financial markets. You know, we look back over the last 20 some odd years and we see an all too familiar pattern in the marketplace, whether it's the Nikkei in Japan in the 80s or the NASDAQ into the Y2K bubble and bust. More recently, Shanghai, we saw the bubble and bust in China. Crude, same thing. And I threw Apple up here just because Apple has been in the news and at 700, it could do no wrong. I could throw gold in here at 1900 as well. We get the idea, the more things change, the more they tend to stay the same. Or as as some have said, Mark Twain, I believe, coined it, history doesn't always repeat, but it often rhymes. We can see through these charts, the bubbles and busts, that history has rhymed all too often. Moving on, just to kind of take a snapshot and a step back, I wanted to play a piece of an interview from 2006. It's from December 2006 as it pertains to the chasm between social mood and the stock market at the time the Dow Jones was trading near all-time highs, but nobody really felt as if we were trading at all-time highs. I'm curious if you think that we are living in a bubble in any way right now. I think that we are living in a bubble, and I think that we've lived in a, you know, in concentric bubbles for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the real estate bubble uh, now is what we're going through, and I think there's a difference between housing stocks as a a proxy for real estate and and what's going on in real estate. Uh, I think we're in a sentiment bubble. I think, uh, I think our whole society is ADD, immediate gratification, Mm -hmm. uh, live now, pay later. Uh, The debt bubble, I mean, we have tremendous amounts of debt. Uh, and you know how and when that manifests I'm not smart enough to know but I've always said that to understand where we are we must understand you know, how we got here and the DNA of this market is much different than a legitimate economic expansion and so what part of it concerns you the most all-time highs on the Dow but it, you know nobody's really feeling like uh, like like we're living in all-time highs in terms of financial performance I think that we have the haves and the have-nots I think the middle class has been completely eradicated or is mm-hmm. in the process of being eradicated So that was coming out of 2006, in December 2006, and the chasm between perception and reality was was pretty uh, was pretty noticeable. And I remember in 2007, more toward the end of 2007, uh, I tongue-in-cheek wrote an article from Minionville.com that talked about how Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears had all fallen from grace. And, you know, the notion seems somewhat silly on its face, you know, the obsession with the whereabouts of a trio of social starlets couldn't be any further removed from the inner workings of Wall Street. One would think, right? Well, you know, we asked that question in, in, in 2007 and, you know, with the idea that social mood and risk appetites uh, indeed shape financial markets. And this was before I caught the socionomics bug. I just had an intuition that the, that the way folks were looking at the world was a bit backwards and that the causality of the, of the world uh, in the financial markets was a bit backwards. But it was more gut than it was, you know, really subscribing to any train of thought. And, and certainly before I really had, had learned more about about the socioeconomics world, but but sure enough, you know we know what happened after that in 2007, 2008. The markets topped, the uh, the tape cascaded lower, and that sort of planted the seed for me. If we look at the chart of of the S and P 2007 and 2008, which was so not hot, Paris, uh, the market got crushed. So that planted the seed in inside of myself and said, well, there's there's a different way we can look at things here, and you can learn a lot just by watching. Uh, and uh, you know, so fast forward a bit, 2010, to look at Tiger Woods. Uh, Ben Roethlisberger, Jesse James, you know, this was during a period in American history where there was just a, you know, a lot of people who were really pissed off, angry, and and, and this this societal acrimony, as as we came to call it, uh, really started to percolate uh, between the haves and the have-nots and the red states and the blue states, Main Street versus Wall Street, it was pick a side or stand aside. You know, but we looked at the profile, the, these high-profile icons, whether it's Tiger Woods, who probably stood out above the rest, 
but it started to suggest that the socioeconomic tide was starting to turn once again, right? I mean, that's what I thought. I mean, that's, that was my gut at the time. Sure enough, it wasn't that easy. You know, the policies that were put in place after the first phase of the financial crisis started to kick in. The social mood was turning. The markets would presumably, or the free markets, I should say, would presumably follow it down. But there were a lot of reasons why the market, a lot of synthetic reasons why the market wouldn't trade lower. You know, it is what it is. You know, you, you trade the market you have, not the market you want. You know, this was 2011. The market could have gone down. I, I won't say should have gone down because the market's always right, but the market didn't go down. And I think that uh, you could learn a lot just from watching that. So the new world order started to take shape. And, you know, that new world order is familiar to anybody who is who follows the markets at any repetition. It seems to repeat in the same sort of process, uh, circular process, it seems to continue. As the market sells off and the outlook deteriorates, people get a little bit more bearish, the policymakers spring into action, the markets rally, uh, all of a sudden things are getting better, uh, policymakers back off, the markets sell off, and around and around we go, and we continue to go, as, as I sit here and, and talk about this in late April of 2013. In my opinion, and this is you know one man's humble opinion, you know in 2008 there was a fork in the road. There was two ways we could have gone in response to the first phase of the financial crisis. There was uh, the medicine that cured the disease, in my opinion, which is debt destruction, and there was the drugs that masked the symptoms, which was the uh, accumulation of more debt and just the same type of behavior that got us into this problem in the first place, the idea that we can continue with this behavior at an accelerated pace and somehow it would solve the problem. But that, you know, is neither here nor there. You know, we all know what path, the you know, we took. Uh, the first path would have been deflation. It would have been a bitter pill. Asset classes would have, you know, stayed under pressure. You know, the debt would have been destroyed. The strongest would have survived. Uh, asset classes, as, as we said, would have taken it on the chin. A uh, dollar would have rallied. Uh, there's a lot of folks who are in debt. They would have to repay that debt in dollars, which would create a demand for more dollars. And once the dust settled, we'd see this outside-in globalization. Outside-in meaning the U.S. doesn't necessarily have to lead this recovery. We can participate in this recovery, and we can do so with some class. For lack of a better word, we can take part in the solution and consider ourselves part of the solution that rather than feeling uh, that we needed to lead the, the recovery, so to speak. But that isn't what happened. It's hard to say what would have happened. By definition, decisions that are made in the, in the heat of crisis are rarely, you know, well thought out decisions. But uh, sure enough, we have continued to give uh, the markets uh, more drugs, uh, another drink, whatever analogy you want to use stock markets at all-time highs. The dollar has not declined, as one might expect, due in large part to the problems overseas in Europe. But, you know, the takeaway, and this isn't, I'm not here to weigh in on policy, but more to observe the, the ramifications of that policy. And that's, that's what this presentation is supposed to be about. But really the friction that has emerged in, in this bifurcated world and how that's manifested through social mood as a consequence of this policy. You know, we in Minionville... Uh, you know, we tend to look at things such as unintended consequences and moral hazard because they're not those they're not the types of headlines that you hear covered very often, but they do matter in our everyday lives, and they matter uh, in terms of the path that we're going to pave, uh, the forward path we're going to pave, and the world that we're going to leave for our children. Um, you know, and I remember with clarity back in. 2005, 2006, when we were at the Minions in the Mountains events in Ojai, California, and Vail, Colorado, respectively, when we talked about this notion of societal acrimony and, and the potential ramifications that it would have for us, and I said at the time, you know, that my fear was that the probabilities of a prolonged socioeconomic malaise was entirely more depressing, that is entirely more depressing than a recession, are higher than most folks have factored into their risk assumptions. In other words, that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction and that the imbalances that we witnessed in the system and I would argue even to this day are cumulative and there is a consequence for those actions uh, whether it's the the consumption the largesse the debt that there is another side to that trade can't really tell by looking at the markets at all-time highs here in April late April of 2013 but something that we need to see as we always look to see and strive to see both sides of every trade. 
You know, but it's important to remember that markets really shape mood to a degree. Even though uh, what we're talking about right now is that the causal, you know, inferences that we all make are seemingly backwards. But to a degree, uh, folks don't want to talk about what could go wrong when stocks are at all-time highs. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about the housing bubble in 2006, 2007 or the looming financial crisis for that matter, uh, you know, even though it was, no, uh, it was no great mystery when you know, the Financial Accounting Standards Board started talking about bringing level three assets back on the balance sheet, uh, it didn't take a rocket science to say, wow, you know, these financial institutions are really, they're over leveraged. But nobody wanted to talk about that. And it wasn't until after the first phase of the financial crisis arrived, like a clap of thunder, that folks, and by folks, I mean investors, I mean policymakers, politicians, nobody really wanted to talk about it until it had already arrived. So the hope of this presentation is to maybe open uh, our eyes a little bit to what's going on around us so we can prepare uh, for what, for what uh, could happen on the horizon before it actually gets here. But, you know, to get back to the point, you know, we mapped... Uh, you know, what we called the tricky trifecta back then. And, and, and that's something that I'm going to talk about a little bit because uh, the tricky trifecta still very much remains in play. And uh, the tricky trifecta, in short, is um, a three phases of, of the social mood that is manifesting throughout society right now. Societal acrimony, social unrest, and geopolitical conflict or strife. Societal acrimony, we could look back at, you know, at the way financial institutions were perceived, uh, the lashback against banks coming out of the crisis, the BP oil spill, the vernacular that we were hearing at the time, the rejection of wealth. Uh, it was pretty pervasive back 2008, 2009. Uh, and we saw then the, the second phase, the social unrest start to manifest, the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, the riots we saw in Greece, the all too familiar shootings that we've seen in schools and movie theaters and the like, all symptoms of this social unrest that seems to be picking up in pace. And, and finally, the geopolitical conflict or strife, the third phase, I don't know what that looks like, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's cyber warfare. Fortunately, that still is playing out, but it's something that we need to be increasingly aware of, not only as citizens, but as fathers and mothers and uh, brothers and sisters as we start to move forward. And we look at what's going on within our borders. And for me personally, you know, a couple of years ago, I moved my family out of New York City because uh, I, was, I was concerned about the direction of social mood. And, and for me, one of the tragedies that hit home the most was the Newtown tragedy, because that could have been any, any town USA. And it's not just Newtown that stands out. And it wasn't just a one senseless act that was that's so horrifying. And through my lens, it's the rate and the pace at which these events have transpired since 2008. And I have a laundry list here, and I'm not going to go through each one of them because it would take up the rest of this, our time together. You know, whether it's Memphis, Tennessee, or Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or or Madison, Alabama, Tucson, Arizona, it goes on and on. Blacksburg, Virginia, Jacksonville, Florida, Oakland, California, Aurora, Colorado, where the dark night rises, you know, and right back to, to Newtown where a gunman killed 20 children and six others at Sandy Hook. I mean, this is, these are not random acts of violence. These are symptoms of a much larger and pernicious disorder, in, in my view, the devolution of, of American social mood. And this is, in many ways, a detachment from a reality and an erosion of the family construct and a marked change that we must be diligent and aware of if we're ever hoping to change this course. I mean, history books will depict this period with the benefit of hindsight and an absence of emotion. But for those of us who who are living it here in 2013, we must figure it out as we go in real time and prepare ourselves for what's to come. So much like the Great Depression, in my opinion, this is an era. Uh, it's not an event. It's not a one-off. And we've learned all too often, whether you know it was 9-11 or whether it was Boston during the marathons a couple weeks ago, that there is a big difference between loss and, and loss. You know, so for those of, uh, of you listening to this and watching this, if you had a bad day trading, you know, let's keep it in perspective. You know, for a lot of people, it is worse, there, and, and there is a difference between loss and loss, and it can always be worse, and for a lot of people, it is. So let's keep it in perspective, but at the same time, let's be aware and keep our eyes open, because there are ways uh, that we can start to assimilate the world and be proactive in our approach. And I'm not talking about one-off suggestions. Uh, I'm not talking about a ban on assault rifles or testing for mental illness or child safety precautions. This is, this is, I'm not 
this is not a political discussion. This is through a broader lens in, in understanding the fundamental differences between socioeconomics and socioeconomics. Socioeconomics posits that the economy drives social mood, whereas socioeconomics argues that social mood drives financial, economic, and political behavior. You know, so here we are at late April 2013, and the markets are trading near or at all-time highs. And you have a lot of fund managers, money managers out there, uh, you know, who are looking at the at corporate balance sheets, uh, which are quite healthy by any measure, and they're just convinced that the Greenspan put has turned into a Bernanke call, and there's no stopping the upside. It's it's, it's almost seemingly there is uniform belief that the market is going higher and, you know, subject to change. But as I'm sitting here on April 29th and recording this, there, the market can do no wrong. It's, we could note or we should note that this type of optimism, this type of behavior in the financial markets has been created by the same policies that have been in play for some time. And that's shifting risk from one perception to another. And as a function of that, in my opinion, the chasm between a stock market rally and a legitimate economic recovery is becoming increasingly apparent. And the bifurcated world, the haves and the have-nots, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But for most people, uh, it doesn't feel like we're at all-time highs, much like the, uh, the interview we did in 2006 in December of 2006. You know, but policymakers, politicians and the like, uh, you know, well, they'll take solace in the fact that the markets are at all-time highs, the housing market uh, has seemingly bottomed uh, that employment, or at least the, measure, the method in which it's measured is, is moving in the right direction. They'll look at things like AIG and say, well, look, we made money, and all is well, kumbaya. And listen, more power to them. I hope that's the case. I, as a father, I, I hope that the better days are ahead of us. But there's a there's questions that remain that, that I don't hear being discussed and that are not being discussed that have massive implications, not only for us, but for our children. They relate directly to consequences, the social consequences of policy and the direction in which we're going. And if social mood, in fact, dictates the price of financial assets, when does this dynamic come home to roost? Uh, when will it express itself through the world's largest, if not entirely free thermometer, that is the stock market? We've all seen the, the societal acrimony and the social unrest, uh, unfortunately. But what's the third phase look like? What does that mean to us? What does that mean to our kids? I don't know. Those are three words that I'm fond of because they sum up a lot. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know when this will come home to roost, uh, you know, if it will come home to roost for that matter. Uh, but I do believe that what goes around comes around, and for every action there's an equal and possibly larger reaction. And I think we would be wise to respect the unexpected. Oftentimes I'm asked, how does this period, uh, you know, in your opinion, relate to the Great Depression? And I always say that I think it's entirely more profound that FDR did not know what a derivative was. Uh, so it's a much more complicated, interconnected world that we live in, and there's no easy solutions, I think, which is one of the reasons why we keep seeing the same repeated behavior, which we'll continue to see most likely until it doesn't work. I know, but Peter Atwater at Minionville and uh, who, at Financial Insights, who's just a tremendous thinker, posed a few questions a couple years back that are really quite profound. At what point does an industrialist become a robber baron or, or a savvy speculator or profiteer? Uh, at what point does success become privilege? And I bring these up now because the answers to these questions have profound implications for the future of free market capitalism, uh, particularly given the quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives on a notional basis that's tying the global economy together. And if calmer heads don't prevail, you know, that ultimately, you know, our, our trading performance, our investment performance uh, might pale in comparison to some of the other ramifications that uh, seem to be on the horizon. But fast forward a bit, let's move on to 2012 and, and some of the social sets that I look at or have looked at as we continue to find our way, whether it's Joe Paterno or <laughs> Twinkies, as absurd as that may seem, or Elmo or Lance Armstrong, all icons, long-standing icons uh, that have fallen from grace or and otherwise come to some hard times. And we move on, whether it's Anne Hathaway or Kim Kardashian or House of Cards, uh, you can start to see how social mood is starting to wrap itself around American society again. The, you know, the zombies as, as a cultural icon. I mean, what does that tell you? Or Blade Runner. These are all significant shifts in the social significance of, of all of these different elements that, uh, in my opinion, whether it's Mantate or A-Rod or, uh, you know, you can go down the list, but I think it really bears repeating 
repeating. And, you know, I'll tie it up by looking at a chart of the S&P 500 index from 1995 to 2013. And we've all seen this chart, or at least you should have seen this chart by now. But it's a pattern, a repeated pattern of behavior where investors get punished at the top and savers get screwed at the bottom. And we've seen it over and over again. As I sit here again on April 29th, 2013, the market is peaking through these levels and trading at all-time highs, and which is undoubtedly going to bring through you know a new rash of speculation and that the worst is behind us. But you know, as we look at the markets and we you know we respect the price action, of course, uh, you know the price action, in my view, is the ultimate arbiter of variant views. So you could be bearish or you could be bullish, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to trade the market that we have, not the market that we want. And the market that we have is trading at all-time highs. But let's not just take that on its face. Let's look around us. Let's pay attention to some of the things that are happening, some of the social icons, some of the social elements that, in my opinion, are a precursor to the price action, not a result of the price action. In sum, and in tying this up, and out of respect for your time, I've listed 12 cognitive biases that, that I've found uh, have endangered investors, or at least, in my opinion, have endangered my investments over the course of my 23-some-odd years trading. And they're listed here for your review. This deck is also available for your review, but I thought it would be an interesting way, or at least an intelligent way, <laughs> to wrap up this webcast. And with that, I will simply say that I appreciate your time. Thank you for spending this time with me, and I wish you and your families and uh, your friends nothing but uh, the very best of times ahead. Thank you very much.